A true dynamo in the tech industry has been Devjani Ghosh. Coming to NASCOM as its fifth president after a stellar career with Intel, Devjani has shown equal capability building relationships with the government, dealing with startups and making every company in the large and small sector feel one industry. We have seen her co-chairing meetings with the Prime Minister, talking to entrepreneurs in India and abroad and truly showing a mission to the entire new community to make India a truly digital nation by 2024. So hello everybody, this is my pleasure to be with Devjani Ghosh. Uh, Devjani is somebody I've known for probably two decades now because she had a very, very illustrious career in, in uh, Intel and we've met her in India, we've met her in Malaysia, so many other places. And it was an absolute pleasure for many of us, me specifically, when she became the president of NASCOM a few years ago. But Devjani, tell us a bit about yourself. I mean, your public persona is well known, but who is Devjani Ghosh? Ganesh, trust you to always ask the most difficult questions. Who is Devjani Ghosh? So I think the best way to sum up myself is I'm my father's daughter. Uh, You know, he, from the day I was born, he has been saying that I am born to greatness and I'm born to do great things and I'm born to change the world. And when you have someone in your life who so strongly believes that you are going to go out there and do things. You start believing in yourself and you start believing in uh, your ability uh, to do great things. So, so yeah, I think that's the best definition of what comes and prompt you to mind that, you know, he, he's the one who shaped my thinking, my values and everything about, um, everything about my life. And, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's really about, um, not just being uh, an advocate for change, but you have to make the change happen. Um, that's, that's the sort of mantra. But still, tell me, tell us a little bit of your journey, because I mean, in a sense, you are every middle-class person's dream. I mean, you've worked here, worked abroad, worked for a multinational corporation like Intel, then came back to India and you're doing such fantastic work for the country and for the industry. So a little more about what were your motivations? I mean, growing up, did you did you ever envisage that you would be working for Intel all over the world? Did you see yourself as the leader of one of the most significant industries in India? How has your own mental makeup changed over the years? I think you know this story, Ganesh, but uh, not many people know, knew it. Forget Intel. Growing up working uh, with technology was not uh, something I really had in my mind. Um, I was just after I finished my MBA, um, like most other people, I decided to, you know, join an ad agency. So I would get a feel of what are the options out there before I took my big leap and joined something, um, joined another company. And that's when I got a call from Intel saying, we are looking for a marketing manager. Intel, if you will remember, in those days, this was 90s was five people. All of Intel India was five people. And I got a call saying, come, we are hiring for a marketing manager. Our country manager met you somewhere and thought you were very good. So come and come for the interview. (laughs) I honestly had no clue about Intel, not what they do. And I was so not interested because I was talking to another company and I was very interested in them. My father pushed me saying, you have to go for this interview. I said, okay, fine. I walk into the interview and for the first time in my very limited at that point career, I actually met a woman at the other side of the table. Um, She was Deborah Conrad. She was the head of sales and marketing for Intel APAC and she had come down to do the interview. Till then Ganesh, I'm not joking when I say that my perspective was that women are usually in HR or, you know, are they, they are never there interviewing you for the job. At that point, I knew I wanted to join Intel. It had nothing to do with technology, to be very honest. But it was all about if this is a company where, you know, a woman can get to the top, this is the company that I want to be in. Um, and then I fell in love with technology. The 21 years that I spent at Intel, I absolutely fell in love with technology, but 
from the perspective of a user. So my fascination is not so much. I'm still fascinated by the billions and billions of microprocessors that go into a chip. I don't think you can ever take that out of me. That's ingrained into me. But I'm more fascinated by what they can do for you and me, the different ways in which they impact lives. Um, and th that was, you know, very early at Intel, uh, somebody, a, a great leader at Intel taught me this, that that was my biggest differentiation in the technology world. Um, I, I, it wasn't about how technology is made, but it was about how technology gets used. And he felt that that's a perspective which very few engineers actually have. And he said, if you bring in that perspective and you continuously keep yourself updated on how technology gets used, what are the new possibilities, you will add so much value to the tech industry and to the company, right? So I took that to heart and that sort of became my field of specialization in a way. You know, it was all about usage models and impact. Uh, and I'm so grateful for that advice he had given me at that point in time, because I think it, I truly found my calling, truly found what I had to do. And, um, it, it, you know, even just look at the last 12 months, right? I think our whole perspective of the role of technology has completely changed. It was no more a good to do thing. It was no more something you used for convenience and for you know entertainment. It was about survival. And it wasn't just human survival, it was about business survival, no matter which vertical you belong to. So it's it's if that was, I mean, that to me was the only silver lining of the last 12 months. Um, you know, and that, that was the teaser. Imagine what the full movie is going to look like as we start figuring out what are the different things we can use uh, technology to solve. So that's sort of and been and the you go there, question on your own view of the industry, because one of the purposes of this is to showcase the amazing growth of the technology industry in India, right from you take right from the 80s up to maybe 20, 2010. So as a person from the outside, Okay, you were working for Intel. You even joined the executive council of NASCOM at some point of time. How did your perception of the industry shape itself? So, you know, when I joined Intel, which was 96, at that point, my charter was, how do you make computers a household name? Because they still weren't. They were still things relegated to offices. And the whole charter that I had at that point was, how do you make computers a household name? And one person who I worked extensively with is your better half, Uma Ganesh, who was that time in Z, and she was driving Z education and leading Z education. And we actually worked together with another friend, Harini, to come out with the first ever consumer TV show about technology and about the internet in those days, right? Which explained internet to people and in terms of education. So, so the journey started there um, in, in terms of showing people what technology can do. And I think as technology has got more and more democratized, you know, it's become much more accessible to everybody. Now it's really about trying to figure out, it's, it's nothing but problem solving. What are the biggest problems we can find uh, to solve with technology and what is going to be the impact on human beings, right? So, I mean, if you, if you look at where it started and you look at how it's going today, despite the crisis, we saw tech spending, especially spending on digital, significantly increase last year. Uh, you will remember that way back, NASCOM had done a 2030 or 2025 perspective. And we had said that, that by 2025, around 38% of the revenue of the IT industry would be digital revenues. Today, we are already above 30%. So we had way underestimated the real potential, right? So we're seeing significant, uh, I would say, integration of technology in every single vertical. I was just in a discussion with Sangeeta Reddy of Apollo Hospitals this morning, and we were talking about how every company today is digital, full stop. There is no debate about should you or shouldn't you. 
The debate today is about how fast and how well do you do it so that you differentiate vis-a-vis -vis your competition, right? So I, I think coming from that place where we had to, we were still figuring out how to take technology into the living rooms. And now we are at a space, uh, you know, at a place in time where technology is weaved into every aspect of how we live, how we work, how we learn, how we play. And the question is, how do we continue to differentiate and how fast do we differentiate um, it to, to rewrite the rules of competition? But uh, if you look at the industry itself, I mean, a very un unlikely story. I mean, I remember in the early days, we were still talking about, can we do $400 million as an industry? Today, under your watch as president of NASCOM, we'll very soon cross $200 billion. I mean, how do you think it happened? I mean, is it, I mean, Mr. Narayan Murthy was talking about the power of the middle class, you know, who can dream beyond everything else. What's your, what's your version of this? I mean, what made this amazing industry happen in an India where most other industries were kind of struggling to be counted? So there are lots of different stories that come together to, def, you know, to define the success or find a reason for the success. I think right place, right time, right people, to me, is what really clicked. Uh, there was a problem globally. There was a huge problem that we could be solving. Um, we had the skills to solve the problem. We invested in the skills. And I think lastly, the one thing that this industry has done differently from other industries is collaborate to really come together and solve big problems. I mean, that's how NASCOM was uh, born, because you guys came together to say, if we work together, we have a much higher chance of global uh, becoming a global leader in technology versus trying to do it individually. That's why the whole, that's how the whole software industry played out. But, but it's really been about, and I do think it will continue to be about talent and skills. To me, that is one of the biggest differentiators of our industry that has contributed significantly. I mean, if you just, if you just look at today where we stand, um, you know, we, we are around a 4.5 million people industry, workforce industry, and we are the largest tech talent pool anywhere in the world. Uh, we, we are leading digital talent pool, a digital skill talent pool in, uh, in the world with around 1.17 million people trained on digital skills. And it's growing at around 30% CAGA, right? I think for us, talent, has been tremendously important. I would, I would definitely say that talent is one of the biggest differentiators for our industry. Yes, our industry has got a lot of help, uh, be it from government, and even if the help was just leave us alone. And you know, it, we don't necessarily go to the government with a lot of us. Sometimes it is just let us be, let us do our thing. And uh, I think that collaboration between government, for example, now, one of the key you know, the, uh, imperatives of success is our ability to convert our STEM talent to digital talent. And this is something where we needed help. We could not have done it on our own. So the government came together in one of the biggest public-private partnerships to join hands with NASCOM and drive a massive initiative to, to train around four more million people in the next few years. So, you know, whenever we have needed it, I think that partnership has, has really worked. And I honestly have not seen any other industry where the most fierce competitors will come together at a single ask and, you know, just, just take the pandemic and take uh, when the lockdown was getting announced. Um, given that remote working was still not a reality for our industry, there was a lot of panic. How do we make this happen? And it was the power of the industry coming together, sitting down, united front with the government to say, we have to make these changes in order for us to ensure that we can continue to work without any disruption. And also sharing, I mean, the amount of best known practices that got shared in those 10 days when we were trying to move 4 million people and over 2 million assets to their homes. 
um, it, it's tremendously unique. And uh, I, I really believe that those are some of the things that have uh, contributed significantly to the success of our industry. So interesting, Devjani. So you're saying right people, right place, right time. And of course, the ability to collaborate beyond maybe individual competitiveness. I think that's amazing. But tell me one thing. I mean, you kind of you've seen this passage both outside and for the last few years as president of NASCOM. And I remember a few months back, and I think you came back from a meeting with the prime minister's office, and you told some of us that look, the 200 billion industry will grow to 500 billion, but the PMO wants to know how to make it a trillion. Okay, and that is an interesting challenge for all of us. So from your vantage position, I mean, if you look at where the industry is today, where do you see the growth drivers? You mentioned talent, but you know, what segments of the industry, is it deep tech, is it products? What industry segments do you really think can scale beyond our own imagination? Yeah, so there are a few trends that we are calling out which will shape the growth of industry. Um, one is just, just look at the tech intensity right and and we are going to see we believe we are going to see at least around a five percent amplification of tech intensity in the next decade so that itself is going to drive uh, consumption of technology and therefore the growth of the industry uh, significantly uh, we do expect the you know around 100, 100 to 125 billion opportunity of tech spend being focused on three priority areas. Integrated platforms, that's going to be critical. Everyone, I mean, gone are the days when you're solving specific problems. Everyone today is thinking about end-to-end -end platforms to address transformation of business processes or um, customer engagements you know, logistics, et cetera, et cetera. So integrated platforms is one of the biggest opportunities that we see. Seamless consumer interface integration. That's going to be another huge, huge area of opportunity that comes up. And then a third area that we see is advanced analytics and of course, data security. Right. These are three big pockets of growth that we see for the industry as we look at the next decade, which, by the way, we call decade because we do believe it's going to be driven by technology. If you look at it from the perspective of which are the technologies that's going to you know, play, I mean, it's not going to be one technology, it's an orchestration of technologies that's going to make it happen, which, which are the lead players we do believe that cloud, artificial intelligence, and cybersecurity will be the lead players in driving a lot of this transformation, right? We also believe that a lot of this is going to be possible only through partnerships. So if our industry is inherently good in collaboration, we are going to have a competitive advantage over others because um, no one is going to be able to do this alone. And last but not the least, I, I, as I said before, I do believe that talent will rewrite the rules of competition. Whoever has the talent will attract the business. Businesses will go where talent exists. So it's going to be all about talent. So those are some of the trends that we see shaping up, which gives us the confidence that we are definitely going to see accelerated growth. And you know, if you look at verticals, I think from India, from an Indian IT industry, there are two big opportunities. One is the digitization of analog industries. It's no more uh, should I do it or you know what are the benefits. It's now all about how fast and how do I differentiate. Manufacturing, healthcare, retail, name it, education. You're going to see massive digitization opportunities. And the second one that I am tremendously excited about is um, the digitization of, of the next billion for India. I think that is another huge, we talk a lot about it, but very little has happened in that space. So that's another huge untapped opportunity. So I think all of this is gonna to come together to give us the, um, the platform that is needed for exponential growth in the next few years. So Devjani, let us, uh, let's kind of segregate these two points, maybe talk a little bit about each. One is the industry itself and the global opportunity. And as I said, we've covered, 
IT services, we've talked about the business process management piece, engineering services, products, et cetera. So how do you see that? I mean, what is going to scale and where do you think the opportunities are? You mentioned integrated digital and platforms, but do you see any of these or any new verticals coming in maybe in the core ICT layer, which can completely change the root dimension of this industry? You know, just, just looking at the way uh, consumer usage patterns are changing and uh, how consumer demands, and I'm not talking of, uh, I'm, I'm talking about businesses as well as consumers here when I say consumer, how their demands are changing. I do believe that uh, the good old services industry is not going anywhere anytime soon. They have tremendous life left but they have to reinvent. They have to reinvent. It has to be about platforms. It has to be about products. It has to be about IP. So there is a lot of reinvention that is needed. Status quo is not gonna cut it for very long, but if the industry can reinvent, which they have shown that they can, and again and again, I do believe there is a lot of life left there. Um, I, I think we will see services and products come together because if when you're talking about platformization, uh, we can't have them exist in silos like we are used to currently, where you have a separate product ecosystem, you have a separate services ecosystem. I do believe that we will benefit the most when we bring our mastery in services and apply it to the growing expertise in products to deliver that end-to-end -end platform need, that platformization need that our customers have. So, uh, so I honestly believe, Ganesh, that um, it's not about which segment. I, do, I think they will play together, uh, but it is about you know, how well we are able to, how seamlessly we can turn it from an either or story to an and story. I think that will go a long way in defining future success. Um, and how seamlessly are we able to reinvent, reskill, et cetera, uh, to, to become the best in this new avatar? Well, that's very interesting. And, and now to move to your digitization of the next billion kind of idea. And you know, we have an initiative in Bharat called Bharat in NASCOM, which is, I think, very passionate for people like me who are doing a lot of work in the social sector. So do you see, in fact, I remember when we wrote that a trillion dollar plan along with McKinsey Global Institute and the ministry. I mean, one thing that kept coming up was multiple platforms, which you also alluded to. So we have this the jam trinity, you know, Jandhan, Aadhaar, mobility. And that's been, the India, India stack story has been amazing. So do you see that as the way to serve the next billion? I mean, platforms for agriculture, for livelihood, for employability, for healthcare. So is that one way that we can actually reach out and serve the entire country rather than restricting it, to, restricting it to some urban locations. Absolutely, um, you know, the platformization of India by key verticals for me uh, has to be the way forward. Uh, what we have seen in FinTech has to happen with health, has to happen with education, has to happen with agri. We have to pick verticals. We can't do it all at one shot. We have to pick priority verticals, but the platformization strategy uh, where we bring together, and, and the way I always, you know, advocate this with government, et cetera, is think of it as a plug and play um, platform, you know, where people are able to bring in their services and bring in their products and fit it into the overall framework, you know, and then we have the data, data layer where you're providing the data, you have, uh, you know, the, the interfaces, you have the security layers all thrown in. So it has to be tremendously easy for the end user to, to frankly use. You know, so I do believe the platformization strategy is critical, but there are a few things, Ganesh, which I do not believe we are still paying enough attention to. Uh, first, we need to see much more investment in R&D in India, not just by government, but by corporate India. See, if we believe that the next billion is a huge business opportunity, uh, taking products which have been developed in the Western world and tweaking them to say that, you know, we are going to dumb it down a bit and then take it to uh, the next billion users is not going to work. We have to think grounds up. We have to understand lifestyles. We have to understand values. 
our products and solutions have to seamlessly fit into their lifestyles and they don't you know currently we expect them to change their lifestyles in order to use our products i think that mindset change is desperately needed and therefore the day we see r and d for india go up significantly i will say that we are finally or or we are at least opening the door to tapping into that next billion potential till then it will be all talk um, i strongly believe it will be all talk so do you think that uh, i mean one of the ecosystem <coughs> partners or that obviously have to come to the party is the telecom environment and both you and i know that i mean we've been talking about the national optic fiber network for ages it became bharat net when fortunately prime minister modi in the independence speech again talked about the nofm so do you think connectivity of panchayats and villages is going to play a major role in the transformation of bharat absolutely i mean you can't even imagine i mean you and i can't imagine life without the internet for an hour forget the day right i mean just imagine if the amount of tantrums we have thrown when internet stops working for even a few seconds you know so so if you have to think of a truly inclusive digital india where no woman or man or child is left behind um you you have to think of universal access to the internet to the bro to broadband let's be clear it's not just internet but it has to be broadband access right so that's a that's an absolute must but the other thing ganesh while i think they have to happen in parallel while we figure out and accelerate the path to connecting every single home we also have to figure out how do we develop for last mile delivery options in india be it healthcare be it education that are designed for low resource environments um we have to think about it and you know we are, we have such brilliant talent we have 4 million engineers who can solve the world's problems so why can't we solve this problem and i think it's going to be very very and this is why i go back to r and d for india it is so critical because these are the problems we have to solve how do we ensure i mean today something that i know both you and i are tremendously passionate about is uh, education good education for everybody one of the places where it breaks down is the last mile where you do not have access to good teachers now you have technology which will allow you for a teacher sitting ganesh you sitting in pune taking a class can be accessed by a kid anywhere in india if you know and the technology exists to make that happen but the problem is you'll be speaking in english i don't trust your hindi fully so you'll be speaking in english now how many kids will be able to understand english or even if you did speak fluent hindi how many kids would have been able to understand now this is where we need to do r and d in india to use technologies like nlp to ensure that while you are speaking in english it gets seamlessly translated into every single indian language so that wherever the kid is he or she is able to listen to you in her own language and able to learn now these are the kind of innovations they're not what do you typically call the really sexy innovations which the western world is driving and we don't need it we just need very practical grounds up innovation to reach out to a next billion users that's interesting point you're making dev jani because one of the founding fathers of our industry uh, mr fc kohli who unfortunately died recently his passion was always hardware for india always In Indian languages for India. So you're saying yeah. we need to address that, otherwise we will have a digital divide in this country. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Now, now that reminds brings me to my an important point. You know, it's very fashionable in every industry, and including our own industry, to say, "Oh my God, we did so well in spite of government." But we all know, in fact, uh, Mr. Harish Mehta mentioned it, Mr. Murthy mentioned it when he talked about Sheshagiri and N. Vittal and people like that. and i think we know that industry has also partnered with government as an important part of the ecosystem and full credit to you i think since you became president of nascom i think the partnership you have built for nascom as well as with all industry players with the government has really taken us forward you mentioned it what happened during the covid onslaught where people could work from home 
So do you see this continuing in future? That there will be a role for government, there will be a role for private sector investment, there will be a role for academic institutions. How do you see the ecosystem evolving in ways which have maybe succeeded in the past, but certainly need to succeed at a scale in future? if we want to win a sprint, we can go alone and win it. But if we really have to win the big marathon that is ahead of us, when you look at the opportunity, it is tremendous. I honestly believe that the power of partnership is going to be far more important and far more impactful than the power of the individual, be it individual companies or an individual industry. Now, see, I, I have a very simple philosophy to partnership. Partner when there is a common interest, partner when there is a common problem that you want to solve, and partner when each of the partners can bring in a specific value add or role that will help you to solve that problem much better than you trying to solve it on your own. Right. And if you apply this approach, whether it is tapping into the next billion or whether it is the digitization of India's analog industries, uh, there is a clear role for our industry, there is a clear role for the domain industry, there is a clear role for government, for startups, for academia, everyone to play, right? Now it's about how well can you orchestrate so that they all sing beautifully together or make music beautifully together versus each one trying to do their own thing. Um, and, and how do you ensure that, um, you know, the partnership is driven by common goals, common metrics, and that's what we do when we, as we work with the government, whether it is on skilling initiative, or, you know, the NASCOM Centers of Excellence drives a lot of the innovation initiative in IoT, AI. It's all about what problem, what, will the, what is the desired outcome, what will success look like, and what are the roles, right? If you get that together, then it works beautifully. Um, and it works much better than anyone trying to do it alone. No, that's awesome. And I think we all hope to see that happening. Okay, just a few concluding thoughts from you, um, Devjani, more personal, not necessarily as president of NASCOM. Uh, one is, of course, I think in the, I still remember the early days of NASCOM and I've been part of this executive council for the, right since 1994. And the participation of women used to be almost anecdotal, the leadership level. Because I remember we had Vinita from IBM, before that, we had Neelam from HP for some time. You came in from Intel, but it was always a problem. And we were all delighted when you told us just a few days ago that you know, the next executive council is almost, what, 39% women. And we're also looking forward to both the chairperson and the president of NASCOM. And of course, many of your own leadership team being extremely bright, extremely capable women. So what do you think has led to this transition? I mean, is it a natural process of evolution of very smart women bubbling up to the top? Is there something deliberate that we have done and we need to do to get more equity into the workplace? So the, the NASCOM Executive Council, there was nothing by design. In fact, we were all shocked, surprised, whatever the word you want to use, when we saw how many women had made it. But this, this, this brings me to a point, Ganesh, which I'm tremendously passionate about. So give me a sec to talk about it. You know, there is, the world right now is facing tremendous talent shortage, especially when we are talking about digital skills, which are becoming an imperative for not just our industry, but every industry. Now, when your success and talent is rewriting rules of competition and success. Now, when your success depends on something, that is, I mean, today, if you look at it just in India, based on the number of job openings that we have in digital technologies, the job openings or demand is 8x higher than the supply available. In two years, if things don't change, we expect it to go up to 20x. So it is a crisis of sorts. Now, when you are faced in this kind of a crisis, the good thing is you stop applying the filters to your talent requisition strategy. You stop thinking about the shape and size you would prefer the talent to come in. You basically just start looking for the best talent wherever it exists, right? And I honestly believe that what this is doing, the talent shortage is doing for the industry is something that we've tried to do for so long and nearly not made much of a progress, which is 
get the industry to take off its gender filters. I think the talent shortage will force us to do it and is forcing us to do it today. Now, on the other side, the question is, are we as women seizing this opportunity to ensure that companies are looking for the best talent? We are the best talent. There is a lot of work that has to happen there. We are not, by the way. At the top level, at the leadership level, even though the percentages are small, but I think we have some amazing women. And if you look at everything being equal, if you look at what, you know, who is the best talent for the job, I think a lot of times you will find that the woman is, right? So I think that's what's driving the change in our industry at the mid and top levels that as more people are looking for uh, leadership, good leadership talent, especially in times where talent is at a shortage, the world is changing so fast on us. Uh, we need people to deal with constant ambiguity and change, et cetera. We need more humane leadership. I'm not surprised that women are getting these opportunities and are getting these roles and it has nothing to do with diversity. Uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer in that, right? And uh, we just have to now ensure it's happening at every single level. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's a push and a pull while uh, the talent shortage will, will force the industry to rethink how it hires we women have to force ourselves to rethink how we invest in ourselves, uh, how we invest in our development so that uh, we are there. We are there and we are ready when the, when, you know, the door opens wider. Well, that's a great point, Devjani. And I still remember when I first took over as CEO of Zensar in 2001, the leadership team of 12 people, we had just one woman who was the company secretary. And I said, we got to change that. So we did multiple initiatives. And in fact, when I left in 2016, out of 20 people in leadership, 13 were women to the extent where men were beginning to feel a little threatened. <laughs> but the even the current organization, I remember the one trip I did make to Pune and you were kind enough to uh, take me for a short visit of your uh, uh, 5F, uh, the office, etc. Everyone I saw was a woman other than that one man who presented a strategy presentation. And I'm so sorry, I forget his name. He was wonderful. He was wonderful. But I just was, you know, I did, I, I took a break and I went to the washroom. And as I was walking, I was looking around. It was just women, women, women everywhere. So kudos to you. Kudos you're, to you're you. You're proving your point. Today, today we have 82% 82, 82 are women. And out of the companies we've invested in, nine out of 11 are the CEOs of women. So we're very proud of it. But I hope at some point it has stopped, you know, becoming something you're trying to do by design. And it, it, it is becoming something that is happening organically. Because to oh, me, much. that's when we will see sustainable. I think, I think every, every woman in leadership deserves to be there. So there's no reservation or whatever. So final question to you, Devjani. I mean, if you were now giving advice to the young Devjani, maybe in Calcutta or Delhi, who's 21 years old. Kenya, you... Kenya. Don't forget, Mombasa. Oh, that's good. I forgot about <laughs> yeah. So what, what would you be advising her? That here is an opportunity in India. Here's an opportunity in industry. And you mentioned some others that women should take, I mean, should also take care of or take account of what they do. So what, what kind of advice would you give to a young person who's 21 years old, stars in her eyes, and wants to be successful? You know, especially in today's, if, if I was, if I was back in time in that space today, there are three things um, I would take a little bit more seriously. Um, first is I would absolutely learn coding. I actually gifted myself on my 50th birthday uh, to do, you know, a, a training program and I started learning coding and I love it. I'm just so addicted to it today that, you know, and, I think this is something, whether you are an engineer or not, you should do. The ability to solve problems, the ability to create your own designs is just so fascinating. It changes your perspective of life. So I would definitely start coding if I could go back in time uh, much earlier. Um, I, would, I would also invest a lot more in, um, you know, just giving myself the time to go with the flow, to learn about things. I've always done, I mean, I've always been a learner, but I just believe that 
I could have done so much more. There's so much more out there to learn, which I missed out on because I did not have the time. And I think that is something you will never get back in life. Uh, you know, that joy of, especially in this kind of an environment where things are changing so fast, uh, I think the, the sheer joy of learning and uh, figuring out new things, it's such a high. Uh, I would have ensured, I started now, but I would have ensured that I would have started much, much earlier. And the third thing is to, you know, while you're doing all this, put a premium on health, put a premium on family. I think COVID has taught us the importance of both. Uh, but those are sort of the three things I would have done maybe a little differently. <laughs> well, Devjani, I think it's your energy and your effervescence, if I may call it that, which really, I think, motivates all of us because I think it's an amazing industry. It's been built by a lot of us. And I think the future very much belongs to young people who will make it happen. So thank you very much for being our leader. And thank you for doing this conversation. I, I walk on the shoulder of giants and I'm thrilled to do that. So that people like you are there. So thank you. Thank you very much, Devjani. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Adar Ganesh. Lovely talking to you.